Hello, everybody. I hope everybody has been doing very well. Um, if you are new here, my name is Mother Della Mort, and this is the Horror Gallery. Uh, we cover dark history, all kinds of high strangeness. So um, we are glad you are here. I think you'll enjoy this one. This one's going to be fun. Uh, we normally give everybody about five minutes to get in here. It looks like the notifications did go off pretty well tonight. So that's a good thing. So, um, so yeah, if you're new here, let us know that you are new and where you're from, because we always like new victims here in the trip. So we're just going to give everybody a little bit of time. I want to go over to the comments. See if everybody pops in. Come on in, come on in. Hello, hello, hello. Guys, the best way to support your content creators is to share, it's absolutely free. So go ahead and do that now while we wait for everybody to kind of file in here. We kind of go on our own standard TBDC time around here. So I usually like to give everybody a couple of minutes to get in. And uh, we're going to take a little trip back in time tonight to go over. I know a lot of our supporters' uh, favorite hobby uh, when they've got some time, and that's dark tourism. The really creepy places on this planet that you either can visit or once were able to visit. And I will tell you that the people from the 18, 1800s and 1900s, early early 20th century, they didn't play when it came to dark tourism. Uh, we're we're kind of uh, milk toast compared to them. So I've got some pretty cool ones. And of course, of all cool places to go, we're going to travel to Paris tonight. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're going to give everybody about two more minutes to get in here. Like I said, say hello. So we've got a couple of people already in here. If you are new, let us know where you're from. Also, don't forget that we do now have uh, Patreon. So uh, go on over there. Now, I will tell you, we did find out one thing with the Patreon, and that is we are not safe for work. So we, we did design it that way because we do uh, delve into the gory. So there are links on our website. All you have to do is click on them. It'll take you right to our Patreon. Uh, we do exclusive content there, extended, like tonight we'll be doing an extended uh, expansion to this, uh, which will go over some exclusive uh, information and, and, and things like that concerning the dark tourism and some really creepy times that took place uh, during this time over there in, in Paris. So um, yeah, go ahead and subscribe to that. All the money does go to support us here at the CBDC Collective. And um, so, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and get started and uh, share, 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 guys. So tonight, like I said, we're going to be talking about dark tourism. What is dark tourism? Well, dark tourism is when you think of going on vacation and doing interesting things and going to historical places, Dark tourism tends to delve more into the darker aspects of history, um, kind of the, the crime, uh, just all kinds of different things. Uh, for instance, uh, like the Paris catacombs, those would be considered considered a dark tourist destination. Things along those lines. So we're going to go back in time, and the way I'm going to do this tonight is we're going to kind of go from rather than start with the oldest. We're gonna kind of jump around just a little bit, but we're going to kind of start with the most recent and work our way back. So I think that'll be fun to do that. And it does look like Tia is here. Uh, hello, Tia. And she says, hello. We are so glad you're here. All right. So we're gonna start off with this one. And this one, uh, I think a lot of people are really familiar with it. Now, the gloriously opulent, Palace Garnier is among the finest uh, monuments in Paris, but also one of the most mysterious. This 1900 seat opera house is home to much more than the largest stage in Europe. It, is, it has hidden passages and secrets that have spawned 
not only a Gothic novel, but a West End musical and many fascinating rumors. Is there really a Phantom of the Opera? Does his hidden lair really exist? And why is a doctor still required at every performance? Well, we're gonna get into that. Now, they might not link to the lair of a resident phantom, but the secret passages in LaRue's novel do exist. There's two of them. Beginning five levels down into the belly of the opera house basement, and it climbs up to its fourth floor by a thin metal ladder. One of the two tunnels is still in use. Now the secondary tunnel, however, now serves as a rainwater evacuation chute. Now legend has it that the spirit of an unknown figure lives in the auditorium where he haunts theatrical performances with a terrible curse. He walks the grand staircase of the opera and hides in the basement. Now, this particular spirit, is his name is often referred to as Eric or Ernest from the legend. But we perhaps know him best from Gaston LaRue's novel, The Phantom of the Opera, which was published in 1910. Now, today it is perhaps the best known opera house in the world thanks to this novel. But as there but was there a legend that inspired this work? Was the legend true? And we have talked about this numerous times about how even though they may seem fanciful, they may seem outlandish, usually you can kind of tell an urban legend uh, or, or kind of leaning into the folklore urban legend when you have several different variation i mean like you know just several different variations but if a story tends to stay somewhat the same then that usually is a good indication it was probably based on something that actually happened or was inspired the legend was inspired by something that actually happened now in this case that is kind of the case now the stories of the phantom are not new Theater goers perform, and the staff have been experiencing eerie encounters in uh, the, the Palace Garnier in Paris since it opened in 1875 um, with a series of unexplained deaths uh, took place here. And it is said that the writer Gaston LaRue, like I said earlier, was inspired by these legends when he wrote his novel, Phantom of the Opera. Now, Palace Garnier, or what we think of here in the States as the Paris Opera, uh, also um, was known as Opera Garnier Paris, uh, is an iconic and historical building that stands as a symbol of French culture and sophistication and is perhaps the most well-known opera house in existence. <laughs> Today, the uh, Paris Opera is mainly used for ballet. The Paris Opera was built in the Second Empire of France. It was designed by renowned architect Charles Garnier as part of a massive construction project undertaken during the reign of Napoleon III. Since its inception, many strange and ghastly legends have surrounded this building, from tales of mysterious disappearances to reports of a deep underground lake that is said to be populated by fantastical creatures. Beyond these stories lies the undeniable fact that there are things about the building that remain unexplored and unknown, leaving much of, his, of, of its enigmatic past shrouded in mystery. Now, very soon after the opening, a stagehand was found hanged. And then in 1896, during a performance of Paul, an enormous chandelier fell from the ceiling and struck a car now, one of the most celebrated and world-renowned musicals of all time, The Phantom of the Opera, takes place in this iconic Paris establishment. The Paris Opera, or, Par or Palace Garnier. The Paris Opera House is an opulent structure with interiors painted in gold and seats 
upholstered in red velvet matching the dramatic stage curtains uh, which hang below a stunning crystal chandelier. And while this building makes for a gorgeous setting for performances, the choices of the Paris Opera in this case was not simply for stylistic re uh, purposes, but because the story was actually inspired from the true events that happened here. In 1873, the original Paris Opera venue on the nearby Rue La, and I am fabulously gorgeous about really, really messing up French words, but I did try to do a little bit of research. So we're going to try this. The nearby Rue La Belle uh, which caught fire, destroying the original space. Now, during the stage fire, a ballerina, in fact, did die, and her free fiance, who was a pianist, was disfigured as a result. Now, legend has it that after the incident, he did, in fact, retreat to the underground of the new opera house um, and lived there until his death. Mirroring very closely the physical appearance and living situation of the Phantom of the Opera character in the Rue story. Now, some sources claim that a body, in fact, was even found many years later beneath the Paris Garnier, uh, though it isn't clear who the corpse belonged to, since prisoners were also once held beneath the present day Opera House at one point. In any case, it seems quite likely that there, that, that there was some sort of body that was found and a relatively chilling fact worth mentioning is that the underground lake beneath the Paris Garnier in LaRue's story is not entirely made up. Indeed, the labyrinth design of the massive building eventually leads down to an underground reservoir, which was built to house the water that kept rising during the groundwork of the construction. And it consistently aided in the house's exceptional acoustics. So it, it really helped the acoustics as well. Now, while it may not be inhabited by a phantom or look quite as eerily romantic as it does in the musical, it does in fact exist. And it is used today by the Paris firefighters to train for rescue missions. And it's, it's kind of creepy. And as for the doctor required at every performance, like I said earlier, that is absolutely true. But this is due to the vast number of audience members at the opera and in case of medical emergency. A qualified doctor must be present at every performance. The lucky person isn't paid for the attendance, but they are lucky enough to be rewarded two free tickets to one of Paris's most sought after theatrical experiences. This stipulation cer certainly gained its ju uh, justification when a female audience member went into labor right in the middle of a performance. So that's a little backstory, a little information on the Paris Opera House, or as many refer to it as well, the Palace Garnier. Um, so it looks like we've got quite a few people in here uh, let's pop in and say hello. And guys, share out. Um, that is the best and it is absolutely free way to support your uh, content artist. All right, so Michelle is in the house and she says, hello, odd mother. Well, hello, hello. And then Tia is saying, hello, odd mother again. And then Michelle is saying, where is everyone? I don't know. Um, I know I go on a little bit later than normal uh, or later than I used to, but that's just because of bandwidth around here. I seem to do better after 10 p.m. Uh, so we've been doing this for a little while, but I imagine it's Friday. I imagine a lot of people are probably out doing things, but that's okay, guys. Uh, people can catch it on the hashtag replay. And we have Calvin in the house. Hello, Calvin. How are you? We are so glad you're here. Um, we've just recently got into it. Um, we were talking about, we're talking about dark tourism uh, of the 1800s in Paris. Uh, and we just got through covering the Paris Opera House and some of the actual um, facts and backstory to the Phantom of the Opera and some of the unique um, 
thing uh, with the Paris Opera House or Palace Garnier. Now, forget boat rides down the Seine, the Seine which is basically, it's, it's kind of like the River Thames for London. Uh, this one is the River Seine uh, for Paris, basically. That's the, the big river that runs right through Paris. Now, forget the boat rides down that river. If you were a tourist in Paris in the 19th and 20th century, the subterranean sewers were the hot ticket. In, in the 1869 travel guide to the City of, uh, of Light, for the, and I quote, for the English and American traveler, Paris's new system of sewers came highly recommended in the sightseeing section. Now, needless to say, Paris was pretty pleased with its new sewer. The city found uh, the city founded on the site was or was founded on the site of an early Roman city called Batiste and had once relied on natural streams to wash away waste. As the population grew, chamber pots were emptied into the street and later cesspits and cesspools were used that required routine cleaning that the city couldn't adequately provide. And we've gone over that before when we were talking about the need for what we think of now as cemeteries versus the old school graveyards. And a lot of it had to do with the sanitary conditions um, that were really taking place during this time, uh, as well as disease outbreaks and things like that. And we're going to get into that on the next episode. Uh, I've got some updates on the Black Death uh, or the Black Plague, as well as I think we're going to talk about syphilis and leprosy. That'll be fun. So, um, but yeah, so so the the Paris so the Paris sewers were built to basically kind of take over where the sanitation was really, really lacking. And for whatever reason, they thought that this would be a great tourist attraction. <clears throat> now, again, because they could not adequately provide sanitation or cleaning of these test pits and, and test pools, a serious series of cholera epidemics did begin uh, to, to basically occur. Um, and Paris was in short, it, it basically it was just in a really stinky mess. But in, and again, we've kind of covered that in past episodes. Um, now, the 1840s through the 1890s saw the construction of Le Gout. Uh, it is a complex system of over 500 kilometers of sewers that lie under Paris. The once putrid city had come to possess one of the most comprehensive and efficient systems in Europe. And by 1930, each street had its own sewer. It was the pride of Paris, so much so that they turned it into a tourist attraction. Now, sewer men became a profession and tours were given by these sewer men on weekends. Surreal illustrations and photographs from the area era show tourists, ladies included, wearing their Sunday best in a boat ride through the sewage system of Paris like it was something out of Disneyland. Now, I, I'm not exactly sure when or why the boat tours were scrapped. I mean, you could only guess, I do imagine. But the Museum of Les, Les Scouts de Paris is still a thing. You can still tour the, the sewers. And travel travelers looking to discover, to discover the underbelly, or should I say the bowels of Paris, can visit from Saturday to Wednesday for about uh, three dollars and fifty cents. Uh, fifty, three, well, three fifty pounds, three comma fifty pounds. Um, now, while some of you might be thinking the city would need to pay you to visit, the museum takes visitors through some rather impressive tunnels in the system, and you will find Napoleon's seal inscribed on many of these walls. So we're talking about a lot of these areas kind of really go back in time. Its entrance, if you were wanting to do that, if you went to Paris, is just a few minutes walk from the Eiffel Tower. So it's super close. So let's see who's in here and then we're gonna go to a commercial break and then we're gonna come back with um, a very interesting tourist destination. 
And I do want to say, and this do does bring up pictures in my mind of like Indiana Jones, but a fun fact about the Paris sewers. Now, cleaning the sewers in Paris in the 1870s literally required rolling giant balls of wood and iron through the tunnels. Back then, now the workers would normally rake muck from the sewers that could be reached safely. But some scenarios called, called, called for something much more extreme. Enter these giant balls of the 1870s. They were forcibly bowled against larger blockages to clear the tunnels. So yeah, um, just keep that in mind whenever you watch Indiana Jones. It just reminds me of that big ball. And they were pretty big, but I, I, I just find that funny. I thought that that was a cute, fun fact. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go to a commercial break real quick. And then we're going to come back and get some of these, um, these comments. All right. See you in just a moment. If I can find it. Get with your nearest cult member. Double stacking is a noun that refers to the action in a horror movie of impaling both members of a canoodling couple. Uh, the creation of the atomic bomb. Uh, what was it? Oppenheimer? Uh, the Manhattan Project. Uh, the, no, yeah, the Manhattan. And everything they're bringing up. I was about to say the Philadelphia experiment. I mean, which one are we talking about here? We go into depth. I'm looking up heavy water. What does heavy water do to, people's, to a person's body? And I'm like, okay, they're watching me now. I know they're watching me. <laughs> And we are back. So let's get over here to the comments for a minute. And then we're going to get into an extremely interesting story and some facts that you may not know. So let's see. Oh, we've got Frank in the house. He says, hello, odd mother, Fwin. Hello, Fwin. Hello, Fwin. And then PBDC is in the house and they say, Willie, Willie, well. Well, well. All right, then. Let's see if we've got anything else. Uh, nope. All right. So let's get into this one. This one uh, was actually the one that kind of started this whole particular topic. Uh, and I just I find this uh, rather quite creepy. Um, and we do kind of do a version of this now, um, which is, uh, yeah, kind of interesting. Oh, and it looks like we have... Evil Henry in the house. Hello, Henry. So glad you could join us. Hello, hello. And then Texas is here as well. All right, so I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole. I'm squirreling out here. All right, so if you were visiting Paris today, you'd probably find yourself walking past the Love Paddock on the Pont des uh, Art, uh, walking through Notre Dame, and a mile from there, you would arrive at the Louvre. Now, if you were in Paris in the 1800s, there would be an altogether different attraction 
that you would almost certainly find yourself in. It was the only free theater in Paris, otherwise known as the La Morgue. Now, I, I, I'm just going to kind of say this in quotation. Now, morgue, it is a verb describing the act of gazing upon the dead. It originated, they do believe, in, a, in some grim Parisian prison and likely led to the French term morgue. Now today, the word morgue conjures up images of efficient hygienic rooms overseen by professionals in lab coats and rubber gloves. Most of us are familiar with the inner working, um, you know, of, of kind of what they do uh, and only from cop shows, like not only from cop shows, but like crime novels, things like that, um, never having had the desire or need to visit one in real life. So it's kind of something everybody kind of knows about, but you don't have to go there to, to, to experience it for yourself. But our image of the modern sterile morgue stands in stark contrast with the room that originally gave rise to this term. In the 18th century Paris, visitors to the Grand Chalet, uh, or Ch uh, Chalet, a combined court, police headquarters, prison and prison that served as the seat of common law jurisdiction in the pre-revolutionary French. Now you could descend into uh, the Bastille, which is basically the basement jail, and peer in through the grill of the door. There, they would, you would catch a glimpse of a small room where unidentified dead bodies were displayed to the public, strewn across the bare floor. Now the room became unfortunately known, like I said, as La Morgue, and early definitions of which appear in the 1718 Dictionary de Academic, Academic uh, basically a place at the chalet, uh, where dead bodies that have been found were open to the public view in order for them basically to be recognized. Now the name for the gruesome room likely had its root in the, uh, the archaic French verb morger, which means to look solemnly. Now historians think that such rooms had existed in Parisian prisons since the 14th century, initially as a place where newly incarcerated prisoners would be held until identified but later to deal with the many dead bodies found in the street or pulled from the sin. In fact, there were so many bodies in that river that a huge net was often stretched across, across the river at St. Cloud to catch the bodies as they washed downstream, from which they were transported to the Grand Chalet. But it was not until around the turn of the 18th century that the public was invited in and asked to try and identify the dead. The stench emanating from the corpses at the morgue, uh, I, I would imagine must have been just absolutely unbearable. And the public exposure to the bad humors as they would refer to them was one of the reasons for the creation of a new, what they considered a more hygienic morgue. At the Place du Marché Neuf on the Ile de la Cite in 1804. And I'm telling you, I am fabulous about butchering these, these uh, French words. So I get them. Now, this new morgue building, by now officially known, like I said, as La Morgue, was housed in a building styled like a Greek temple that was close to the river, enabling bodies to be transported transported there by boat. The corpses were then displayed in a purpose-built exhibit room with plate glass windows and plenty of natural light, allowing crowds to gather and gawk at the corpses laid out on the marble slab. Now, during this time, there was no refrigeration. Refrigeration did not come about until around the 1880s. So the bodies were kept cool with a constant drip of cold water, lending the cadavers to have a bloated appearance. Now the clothes of the deceased were often hung from pegs next to the dead as a further aid for their identification. Now the central location for the morgue ensured a healthy traffic 
of people of all classes becoming a place to see and be seen and to catch up on the latest gossip. Its popularity as a place of spectacle grew as the 19th century progressed. Stoked by being included as a must-see location in most guidebooks of Paris. On the days after a big crime had been committed, as many as 40,000 people would often flock through its doors. The morgue was also written about by luminaries such as Charles Dickens. Dickens also described the crowds of people flocking to the morgue to gawk at the latest arrival, idly swapping speculation on causes of death and potential identity. And I do quote, and this is from uh, Therese uh, Requinzoia, uh, which perfectly captures the popular appeal of the morgue with all of its grisly drama and spectacle. And I quote, the morgue is a spectacle within the reach of all pockets for, all, for free for all it is, the poor and the rich. The door is open, anyone who wishes enters. There are fans who make detours so as not to miss a single representation of death. When the slabs are empty, people leave disappointed, robbed, mumbling under their breath. When the slabs are well furnished, then there is a good display of human flesh. The visitors crowd, uh, crowd, crowd each other. They provide cheap emotion. They scare one another. They chat, applaud, or sniffle, as, as if at a theater. And then they leave satisfied, declaring that the morgue was a successful day. Now, the Paris morgue was regularly featured in journals and travel books of the era. While there was often an undercurrent of moral disapproval at the voyeurism inherent in the morgue's attraction, its popularity as a free public spectacle knew no bounds. In 1864, the morgue at Morche Neuf was dem uh, demolished to make way for uh, Baron Hostman's sweeping remodeling of Paris. The new morgue building was situated just behind Notre Dame, again in a busy public space reaffirming its purchase purpose as a place to view and identify dead bodies. A visitor to the new morgue in the 1860s would have been in for a grand spectacle for everyday drama. If the body on the display was uh, a cause basically uh, to celebrate, a visitor might have to queue for hours, like if it was like a murder, like a popular murder or, or criminal or something like that. They would often have to queue for hours just to gain entrance. In a single day, tens of thousands of men, women, children of all classes might come to view the latest media sensation, such as that happened in the case of Lafayre Baylor um, in 1876 and the mystery de la Rue Bern Bra 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 in 18. 1986. And if I remember correctly, these particular cases um, are also known as the woman cut into pieces. <clears throat> now, in the first case, a man dismembered his lover. Her body was fished out of the sin in two packages, while the second related to an 18 month old girl found dead at the foot of a staircase. Now, both cases caused an ongoing media sensation, keeping the cases in the news. Uh, which kept basically the crowds coming into the morgue uh, in their thousands to view the corpses and speculate on circumstances of their demise. Ironically, in Boyroy's case, tens of thousands of visitors thronged the morgue to view his victims remains. Less than 600 people actually attended his execution. Now, the layout of the building created kind of a peak show for the crowds as they patiently jolted forward. Billboards and posters advertised the corpses within. Visitors were ushered in, in single file direction. Corpses were displayed behind vast, vast plate glass windows, draped with long green curtains, which only succeeded in adding a more theatrical nature 
to this experience. Bodies were laid out in two rows of six, naked but for a cloth covering their modesty. Items belonging to them were hung up near them. In some cases, such as Ru, uh, the Rue Vert Vos, Bach, that's a weird word to say, Bach case, um, as well as the Mystery de Serene, uh, which were two girls retrieved from the sin, uh, which tr triggered speculation that they might have been sisters. Now, drama was added to the tragedy by posing these two particular bodies in chairs in a kind of tableau rather than on the cold hard slab. Now, due to initial misidentification, the, the two sisters or who they thought were sisters, um, these little corpses had to be put back on display even after the bodies began to significantly decay, which must have been both a very macabre and a very sad sight, honestly. And as as such, it was just the kind of spe spectacle the crowd came for. But of course, the morgue served as far more than a public spectacle. The new morgue had an autopsy room, a small laboratory for chemical analysis, and rooms where police and administrators could inspect bodies and record murders and different findings. The emphasis did shift. Uh, the morgue was no longer purely uh, dependent on the public to identify the bodies. Uh, it now had medical, administrative, and investigative officers doing that work, moving it closer to our modern idea of what a morgue is. Now, by the 1870s, photography was being utilized when corpses were no longer suitable for display. And by the 1800s, refrigeration was introduced. To describe places where the dead were kept in both Britain um, and America, the word morgue is what began to be used. Replacing the older term dead house and becoming synonymous or, or yes, yeah, synonymous with mortuary. Now the Paris morgue closed its doors to the public in 1907 and a combination of factors led to the decision, gradually changing public attitudes to the viewing of dead bodies, concerns over hygiene and the spread of disease, and the increasing professionalism of police and coroners. Its replacement was the Medico Legal Institute, which actually remains today. And kind of an interesting fact about um, the display before refrigeration was like introduced and when they would constantly have, to, because it, it wouldn't take long for these bodies to basically start to putrefy. Um, but if it was an extremely popular body. Um, it, was, it was not uncommon for them to replace body parts, eyes, uh, they would replace eyes and often replace, replace body parts, such as the first case of the woman cut pieces uh, with wax models, they replaced her head um, to go along with the body parts. Uh, so yeah, it was, um, it was a spectacle for sure. <laughs> Now, the, this is a fun fact and uh, I find really, really fascinating. Now, the most famous corpse to come out of the Paris morgue may not have been, you know, some sort of spectacle dead. Now, L'Anconu de la Seine uh, was a woman who was reportedly fished out of the Seine in the 1800s after she successfully committed suicide. Now, arriving at the morgue uh, with a Mona Lisa smile on her face, an assistant was so taken with her beauty that a cast was taken of her face. Rather than drift into obscurity, that cast, cast death mask, spurred a fascination that peaked in the 1920s and the 1930s. Many households contained the death mask of this particular woman and many liter literary works were inspired by her story. Despite her origins being unknown, she was rumored to come from Germany, Russia, and even the UK before meeting her end in Paris. In the 1960s, her allure continued when she inspired the face of the first CPR dummy 
rescue Annie. The most kissed lips in the world. So the, yeah, I, I find that really, really cool. So let's get into um, the comments real quick because it looks like we've got a few people in here uh, and then we're gonna finish this up. Looks like we're running a little early tonight. So we can sit here and chat for a little while if you want to. Um, but let's see what all's going on. Let me get up here. Oh my goodness, there's been a bunch of people. All right, so um, he is, or he, she, I'm, I do apologize, is asking how do they identify bodies now? Um, I would imagine it would be somewhat similar. I, thankfully, I've never had to go and identify a body and knock on metal, I, I, I hope to never have to do that. Uh, but I would imagine it would be a combination of family members, tattoos, maybe drawings, um, like likenesses, that kind of thing. Uh, they definitely don't put them on display anymore like they did back in France. Um, but that is a good question. That is a really good question. I will look that up and see if I can come up with that, that uh, uh, information on the next show. That is a good question. And Hex has asked, were they good humors? Um, well, I guess you're, okay, so your humors. So when they talked about, and you'll hear this a lot when you read like, more historical stories and, and thing, you know, historical accounts and things like that, they would refer to miasma. And I know you've heard me say that several times. Um, and kind of the way that they would do this, um, because I am reading a book right now that is extremely interesting about leprosy <clears throat> in medieval times. And this, this good humors kind of comes from that time. And basically the body at that point in time was thought to be ruled by humors. And I do believe that would be, and they were connected almost like um, something similar to alchemy um, because alchemy and that kind of thing kind of is, in my opinion, even though grossly off base, is kind of the basis of what we think of as modern medicine. It was just kind of a progression. We went from folklore-ish type beliefs and old wives tales and things like that which a lot of times they may not have understood why they worked, but in medieval times, they did, some things did seem to work. Um, just like, for instance, and I know I'm going down a rabbit hole, uh, when we think of the plague doctors, uh, if you research any about the plague doctors outfit, uh, often they were impregnated, the, the, the robes that they wore were impregnated with either animal fat or wax in essence, kind of inventing the original hazmat suit. So they, they, they definitely didn't know what we know now. But anyway, to get back on track, the humors were basically the parts of the body that ruled the health. And they were connected to earth, wind, fire, air. Um, and I think there was one more, I do believe. But basically, um, it would be bile, your uh, phlegm. I can't remember the other two. We'll go over that when we go over leprosy. But they thought if one of those humors got off balance, you would now be basically, you, you would have bad humors. Uh, you would be in ill health. And that's when, you know, they bring in like the leeches and the, the fleems to do the, the, the bleedings and, and all that kind of stuff to help balance out the humors. Um, but an interesting thing is they do did actually, um, you know, prescribe clean water and uh, healthier foods, which would often be based on your humors, whatever humor they thought was basically causing the health problem would be basically what they would tell you to eat. But, but it wasn't bad stuff. Like it could only help, uh, clean water could only help. It's not gonna hurt, uh, but that's, that's a very long answer for what you asked, Texas. That's what the humors are. Uh, so I imagine if you were in good health, you had good humors.
Frank asked, have the bodies hit the floor? Well, it does seem that in those cases of the Paris morgue, uh, there were several bodies that hit the floor. And Kisa's here. Hello, Kisa. So glad you were able to make it. Um, I know I, I know everybody's probably busy tonight. It's Friday night. Uh, it has been actually really, really pretty weather here for the most part. And we have been outside a lot as well. And we have Van Shane in the house. Hello, Van. So glad you were able to make it. So glad you're here. I hope you find this interesting. And then Raven's here. She says, sorry, I'm late. It is quite all right. Uh, you can always hit uh, hashtag replay if you want to catch up on what we've already talked about. And then Henry says, I like a good story included, you know, plus like the history and, you know, all the creepiness. I do too, Henry. I do too. It has been a while, Van. I am so, like I said, I'm so glad that you were able to make it tonight. All right, I think that I got to everybody. All right, and Henry said that he subscribed to our YouTube. Thank you so much, Henry. We really do appreciate that. And that really does help us. Uh, that helps the algorithm, that, that helps us to be seen more. There are all kinds of really, really free stuff uh, that you can do to help any content, uh, content creator that you do enjoy sharing, subscribing, uh, that kind of thing is like the best, absolutely best uh, thing that you can do. But don't forget, anybody that would like the expanded episodes as well as exclusive content, we do now have a Patreon, uh, but you're gonna probably most likely have to uh, follow the link on our website uh, because we found out we do not show up in the apps search engine. We will with a browser, like if you're on your desktop or something like that, uh, but we will not in the app and that's because, no surprise here, we are not safe for work. <laughs> but we did design it that way because we do get into a lot of things in Patron that um, uh, is not normally allowed on the uh, the public platforms. So yeah, so um, if you're looking to support us that way, not ne it's not necessary, it's not required, but if you are uh, looking to do that, we do have a patron uh, and that helps us on the back end with um, costs and electronics and things like that in order to bring you guys even more awesome content. All right, so let's get into the last part of this and then we'll be switching over uh, to patron to continue with this in our expansion episode. And we're gonna be talking about Paris rules over there um, in the patron. So that's gonna be, it's very, two very interesting, very interesting stories from the past. So basically, you know, we kind of went over some of the really dark and macabre. I did not go into the Paris catacombs because we've already done that before here. Um, exclusively but i wanted to give you guys kind of you know some other things because like i said back in the 18 1800s 1900s early 20th century um they 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 didn't play around when it came to some of the creepy stuff except for maybe the sewer tour like um I, i'm good i, I don't want to get in a big boat boat and float around and and poop i'm good so anyway so we may look back and wonder how the people of Paris could look upon the swollen and degraded bodies of their fellow man and not be affected, only to remember that death was much closer to them than it is to us. People were still being executed in public until 1939. Pneumonia and the flu were still a common cause of death. Infant mortality was high and most people died at home. As medical science improved, people of all ages began to survive in greater numbers and death slowly disappeared from our view 
into hospitals and hospitals. Now that's not to say that we don't still have our own attraction of death today. The Body Works exhibit took the world by storm when it debuted in Tokyo in 1995. The odorless and plasticized cadavers that have traveled throughout Asia, Europe, and America may have been sanitized in comparison to the 19th century dead, but the visitors were just as keen to see them. Like the Paris Morgue, Body Works exhibits were accused of immorality, desecration of the dead, and of treating death as a spectacle. As a result of the controversy, different legis legislations have passed around the world regarding the use of human remains. Yet, despite all these changes, and um, our fascination continue with over 40 million visitors to the Body Works exhibit alone. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm really having to study on this next one we're going to be doing uh, in two weeks. Um, we're going to be talking about disease. Don't you love talking about medieval disease? I find it fascinating. Uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of different ones that you had to worry about back then and kind of how society reacted um, to these particular diseases. And one might really surprise you. Uh, it did me uh, because I think that what we think of today concerning one of these diseases uh, and how basically society treated them, we may be completely off base. Um, at least that's, that's what I'm finding out reading some, some of these books. So uh, yeah, we'll be talking about medieval disease next time. So we're going to go ahead and we're gonna be switching over to our Patreon uh, and uh, meet us over there if you're interested in doing this. I know that we've, we've got a few subscribers already uh, and we really do appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you so much. And we really do appreciate you guys that, that share and stuff like that. Like I said, that is the best thing you can do. Uh, but we're going to be talking about Paris rules, uh, interesting stories, interesting stories. So I hope everybody has a great upcoming weekend. Uh, and it, let me see if we've got anything else going on here in the comments. And so Kisa says she can handle San Francisco or San Fran, but maybe not the sewers. Yeah, I imagine Paris because, again, I've never been to Paris, uh, but I have heard several people that say it is absolutely beautiful at night, uh, but it's a little dirty during the day. So I don't know from personal experience, but I do know that you would not find a odd mother down in the sewers of Paris. Uh, some do say that you really should wait to eat your lunch till after the uh, the tour, and I, I I can understand that. I can understand that. And yes, Kisa said I would not get into a boat and float on poo. No, me neither. Me neither. Ugh, that would be awful. And you know, there's got to be rats and stuff down there. You know what I'm saying? I just, I, I don't, I mean, I understand like this was during like the industrial revolution and like people were just being gobsmacked by like all these new inventions and things like that. But I'm good. I'm good. I'm just good with my street having a sewer. I don't need to know what's down there. I'm cool. Yes. So, uh, so uh, Hexa says, now you need to also buy our shit. So yeah, buy our shit. Exactly. All right, guys. Well, I hope you guys, like I said, have a great uh, upcoming weekend. We will see you here in two weeks to talk about disease. Yay. Um, and we will see you guys later. Bye. Pleasant nightmares, guys.